Autodesk's customers use 3D CAD software to design a range of creations, from that game character you saw in the previous slide, to buildings, bridges, or jet engines. This is the CFM56 turbofan engine. It's one of the most common jet engines in the world. It has tens of thousands of components inside it, and it was designed by a consortium of companies over 40 years ago. It continues to be manufactured today. At Autodesk, we believe that this traditional world of design and manufacturing is radically changing. Let's take a look at a few examples. So you no longer have to be a billion-dollar company to build something like this. You could be Moon Express, a five-year-old startup creating a new type of robotic lunar lander. This is already being tested at NASA's Kennedy Space Center. New tools for design, simulation, analysis, and fabrication are making this accessible to more people than ever before, and it's driving innovation. Unique is an innovative company bringing prosthetics to become a fashion statement for people. Individualized designs are produced in concert with the company and are then 3D printed to produce a truly bespoke product. This would never have made sense in traditional manufacturing and design. Lastly, the Weiss Institute at Harvard University has been working on a nanorobot capable of targeting individual cancer cells. The structure is formed from strands, strands of DNA that form a container. Inside that container is a single dose of a cancer drug. It's held shut with protein-sensitive locks that, on encountering the surface of a cancer cell, cause it to open, and it releases the drug directly. So it's clear that there's significant disruption happening in the world of creation. <clears throat> the different disciplines, people with different backgrounds, are coming together to imagine, design, and create in faster cycles than ever before. But there's an unresolved issue underneath the surface here. It's data. Let's take a look what I mean. So this is a four-cylinder engine. It's reminiscent of those used in British sports cars from the 1950s. Let's take a look inside. Not only is the number of components inside there staggering, but imagine also all the material, functional, purchasing information that's in there too. Because the information is fundamentally ge geometric in nature, describing it, organizing it, and finding it is difficult. Then, multiply this over decades of different products and versions of products, and you begin to get a sense of the size of this data problem. This leads to designers starting from scratch when they create a new design. This causes problems just in the design process, and it slows it down. But it can also cause very expensive problems when these products are actually manufactured. So you might ask yourself, well, aren't there standards that one could use? Aren't there, isn't there part numbering systems that we could use to manage this? Well, as Andy Tannenbaum once said, and of course, it's really easy to make your own too, right? So, you know, most companies resort to a constant cataloging and data management exercise to try and gain control of this, and, and honestly, few are truly successful at that. Lastly, let's consider 3D printing. Now, custom components are available to more people than ever before. It's cheaper and easier than ever to 3D print the ideal component for just your design. In this world, part numbers mean nothing at all. The only way you can consistently describe these objects is what they look like and how they're actually used. So let's take a look at how we believe the world of design is changing. Emerging is a perspective that looks at design as a living system. So the important question is, how does nature do design? Nature fundamentally designs by taking the best existing solution to a problem and iterating. We tend to start most of our designs from scratch. This results in retreading the same old pathways again and again, leading to only inc incrementally better results, whereas what we're really after are revolutionary outcomes. Nature only moves forward, and for us to experience the same kind of progress, we need to be able to consider the potentially huge corpus of existing ideas and designs. So at Autodesk, we're working on technology to help our customers navigate huge repositories of designs, assets, ideas, schematics, to help them with their current design problem. Let's take a look at how we're doing that. 
The system is a machine learning system that operates against millions and millions of 3D models and discovers patterns inherent in those models. <clears throat> it's a completely unsupervised system, so it requires no human intervention whatsoever. As the algorithm goes, it begins to produce taxonomies. Here, it's now begun to identify every nut and bolt that was unique across all designs that I ever created. It's understanding what the elements are. A larger circle here indicates a standard component because it's found dozens with similar dimensions. And as the system goes, it begins to add more and more categories until ultimately you've got a living catalog of everything you've ever created that you can now use in your next designs. So it's important to re recognize here, these are simple parts that I'm showing you. These are standard components, but this will work with anything that has shape. So if you're a game designer, your catalog would probably look very different. It would consist of arms and legs and swords or monsters or in literally anything, anything that has form at the end of the day. Um, but we can actually do better than this. Um, taxonomies are very good at organizing things with similar characteristics. But what if we begin to look at how these things relate to each other? What if we begin to understand the context? So <clears throat> this is the idea that our system can actually look inside assemblies and examine every relationship between every part. This allows you to start understanding how things work and what they do. So this is the notion that a gear can understand that its most common relatives are other gears, axles, pistons, and so forth. OK, so let's, let's take a dive deeper again and actually look at how our systems actually work. Our system begins by analyzing the shapes themselves of components. It uses an ensemble of algorithms to analyze shape. Now, it's important to note that the reason we use shape is because it's the only data signal that's consistent across everything. If you don't have shape, you don't have a 3D component, whereas all other metadata is a little uncertain. So <clears throat> our system is called the design graph, and I'll explain a little bit more why it's called the design graph in a minute. But here we're seeing a cluster of Lego bricks that it's identified as being similar. So you might ask yourself, that. Those don't really have the same shape, do they? Um, well, actually, they do in some sense. They actually have the same features. They are sh shape features here. In this case, it's the connective studs of the Lego bricks that's caused this to form a cluster. Conversely, these chairs form a cluster as well. But in this case, the features of the chairs are not what's relevant. Rather, the overall structure of the chairs or the topology of the chairs is what's creating this cluster. This is the essence of what makes this a difficult problem. Not only is the feature space here very complex, but the interpretation of the feature space is contextual. It's dependent on how the designer actually thinks of these objects. This is what brings us to the graph nature of what we're doing. So the design graph is fundamentally a knowledge system. It's a knowledge graph. And at the core of the knowledge graph are all of the components that it's discovered across every single design that you've ever done. At the next layer of the design graph, we begin to introduce the concept of classifications of these components using the algorithms we just talked about. So there's another ring of data, if you want, into the graph. Then, continuing in this fashion, we ultimately move to the systems level. This is the level where we understand the patterns of combinations of components. Often, this is the level at which designers actually think when they design. Finally, we reach the level of the entire model itself. This is interesting. So at this level of the design graph, we are able to categorize entire categories of products, buildings, movie characters. We can identify what they are. But what's interesting is we are not, at this level, identifying these models based on their shape or their macro geometry, their overall shape. We're rather identifying them based on the components from which they're made and how they're put together. And that turns out to be how we as humans tend to think of these things. So, at this point, the design graph is now capable of learning a complete history of every single design and every single component that you have ever used in a design. And it can use that to help you with your next design. So we've looked at a system that understands what things are and how they relate to each other. But what if we could understand what these things do? 
That's where we're going with all this, a system that learns in much the same way that we do, by referencing online catalogs, parts systems, or real-world examples. The end result is a tool that works in a lifelike manner to honestly help us with our design problems. Using everything that is as the starting point for everything that will be, it's the way nature works, and it's our model for these new tools. Thank you.